Good morning, Sandyford. Uh, welcome to the service. Thank you so much for the kind invitation to uh, join with you. Please turn with me to Mark's Gospel, chapter 11. We're going to read the first 11 verses, and the heading in my Bible is the triumphal entry. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Tell him, the Lord needs it, and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing, untying the colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they'd cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. And we do pray that the Lord will bless his reading, this reading, uh, to our hearts. Let's take a moment to pray together. Father, it's wonderful for us to have the opportunity of reading your precious word. We know that we live in the 21st century, but Lord, would you help us in some way to be transported back in time so that we might be part of that crowd, observing all that's going on. And we pray that as we look at this, that our hearts would be stirred to worship you as the coming King, the one who brings peace. So please help us, Lord, and grant that the glimpse we catch of you this morning would thrill our souls and cause us to praise you in a way that will please you. We ask these things, Father, as we say thank you in the precious and lovely name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, we come to a really interesting uh, point in the Gospel of Mark. The writer just focuses in on Jesus as the gospel approaches its climax. Now, we know that Passover was about to happen, and Passover was a season of great delight for the Jews. Uh, it wasn't a season that the Roman occupiers really enjoyed greatly at all, because Jerusalem would have been filled with thousands of Jews from all over the world, and they'd come, they'd come to worship, and their hearts were filled with excitement and also with nationalistic fervor, because the Passover represented that time in history when God acted on behalf of His people, delivering them from slavery in Egypt. And the, the Jews had the hope that a day would come when God would deliver them from being under the iron heel of the Roman Empire. The population of Jerusalem almost tripled during the Passover time, making it necessary for the military units of the Roman army to be on special alert, because they lived with the possibility that some enthusiastic Jew might try to kill a Roman official or instigate a riot in the city. Remember that Barabbas was imprisoned at that time for insurrection, for rising against Rome, so the Romans were very aware that it was a tense and sensitive time. Now, into this situation came God's servant. And we know that in less than a week's time, he was to be crucified, because the religious leaders were plotting together how they might kill him, because so many people were believing in him. And believing in him meant that they were not following the religious leaders, and they didn't like that. A little while earlier, Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead, 
And in John chapter 12, we read, now the crowd that was with him, that's Jesus, when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So Jerusalem was heaving with people, and everybody was talking about Jesus. And I guess the question that a lot of folks were asking is this, could Jesus be the Messiah? And if he is the Messiah, is he going to make some kind of political move that will remove the Romans and set us free? So what would Jesus do? And of course, they would also have been wondering what on earth would the authorities do in response? But let's focus in on the text as the writer just zeroes in on, on much of the detail because there are a number of things for us to learn. And the first thing we learn is that there was very deliberate preparation in what was going on here. Look at verses 1 and 2. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. H how did Jesus know where the donkey was? Well, we're not told, and it probably wouldn't be profitable to speculate. But verse 3 tells us that Jesus gave them some instruction. If anyone asks you what you're doing, say the Lord needs it and we'll send it back shortly. Well, we know that the owners of the donkey, or at least those who were standing around, watched the uh, disciples untie the donkey, but they let him go. It's likely that they had heard of Jesus and believed that maybe they could trust him. But I think that they probably felt uh, it was an honor to uh, meet his request. Now, we know, don't we, that Jesus was working to the Father's timetable. He had carefully ordered everything. We know that the day and the hour of his crucifixion had been selected in eternity past, and this triumphal entry on the Sunday would precipitate his crucifixion on Good Friday, followed by his burial and by his resurrection on Easter Sunday morning. But we ask the question, why did Jesus choose to enter Jerusalem on a donkey, especially on a donkey that had never been ridden before? I don't know much about donkeys. I know a little bit about horses, and I suspect if a donkey hadn't been ridden before, just like a horse, they would object to the weight of a rider sitting on their back. So why did Jesus choose a donkey, especially one that had never been ridden before? Well, Jesus was purposefully going public, something that he hadn't done before. He'd always shunned publicity. And when folks got very enthusiastic and wanted to crown him king, Jesus always slipped away to minister somewhere else. Most people today wouldn't be impressed by Jesus riding a donkey because a donkey is deemed to be a beast of burden, but in Jesus' day, it was deemed to be an animal fit for a king to, ri to, to ride. Some 500 years earlier, Zechariah had prophesied that the Messiah, the Savior, uh, sent from God would enter Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 the prophet writes, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly, and that word is gentle, lowly, uh, and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Very interestingly, that Jesus consciously fulfilled this prophecy to the letter. In fact, he exceeded it because he chose a, a colt that had never been ridden before. And that was because in the ancient culture, when an animal was set aside for a specific sacred purpose, it couldn't be used for anything else. So Jesus rode a donkey that had never been ridden before. I don't know if you've ever looked at a donkey, but it's interesting that because a donkey is the only animal that I'm aware of in creation that has a cross on its back. 
And uh, some folks like to say that's because Jesus chose to ride a donkey into Jerusalem. Well, in that, that may be true. It may not be true. I'm not altogether sure. But what I do know is that in fulfilling this prophecy, Jesus accomplished two purposes. First, he was declaring himself to be the Messiah, the long-promised Savior, declaring himself to be the king that Zechariah wrote about. And then secondly, he was challenging the religious leaders because Jesus' actions set in motion the official plot that led to his arrest, his trial, and his crucifixion. The Jewish leaders had decided that they weren't going to arrest him during the Passover celebration, but God had determined otherwise because the Lamb of God had to die at the Passover. Remember what happened at the Passover when God delivered his people from slavery? Remember, it, when I see the blood, I will pass over. A, a, and that was a, a picture of what was to come when the blood of Jesus was uh, shed on the cross so that when God sees the blood, the angel of judgment sees the blood, he will pass over and that we might not die under a judgment of condemnation. Now, I just love the way Zechariah describes Jesus. Uh, he is lowly or gentle, and I, I love that description of Jesus. Jesus came peacefully, bringing peace with him. 750 years earlier, uh, Isaiah the prophet wrote about Jesus, and he said in chapter 9, verse 6, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace, gentle Jesus. Do you remember when the angels appeared to the shepherds? Luke chapter 2 tells us about that. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. He came riding into Jerusalem to bring peace, but he came also as a king. See, your king comes to you. And that speaks to us of his authority and his power and his might. And this is the king who said and still says in Matthew 11, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So as we look at this passage, we see a really deliberate preparation uh, that Jesus was following the Father's timetable. Well, let's move on then think of the triumphal entry. It says in verse 8, many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut from the fields. All eyes were focused on Jesus. And not only did the exuberant followers place their uh, clothes on the donkey to make a, a saddle for Jesus, some actually threw their robes on the road, on the ground, as a gesture of reverence. And I think what they were uh, indicating was their willingness for him to have everything of theirs, even to trample on their possessions if he so desired. And they did this repeatedly. So I can just imagine folks laying their uh, robes on the ground and Jesus moving on the donkey over the robes and then them picking up the robes and running around to get ahead of Jesus to put the robes down again. So as Jesus went towards Jerusalem, he went on a, 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 on a carpet of clothes and of palm branches. In verse 9 and 10, those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. And they may have sung that as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a chant, one group chanting one thing and then the next group chanting the next thing and so on as it was repeated. And that lovely expression comes from Psalm 118. And it's recorded in all four of the Gospels. I, I wonder 
as they watched on from a distance what the Romans thought about all this carry on. Now, the Romans were expert at ceremonial stuff, and they had what they called their Roman triumphs. And while we call this the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the Romans wouldn't have called it that because their idea of a triumph was very different indeed, something to behold. When a Roman general won a campaign against an enemy of the empire he, he, and conquested uh, 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 and completed a conquest against an enemy, he was welcomed home with an official parade that was very elaborate. And in that parade, he would uh, exhibit his trophies, his booty, the stuff that he'd captured. He would also have marching uh, the, the prisoners that he'd captured. Uh, and the victorious general rode in a special chariot. The, the priests would have burned insults and the crowds would have been shouting his name and praising him. And the procession ended in the arena where the prisoners that had been taken captive would have had to fight wild beasts for the entertainment of the Roman people. That was a Roman triumph. But Jesus' triumphal entry was nothing like that, but it was a triumph just the same. He'd been anointed as God's King and Savior, but his conquest was spiritual and not military. A Roman general had to kill at least 5,000 enemy soldiers before he was awarded this Roman triumph. And in a few short weeks, the gospel would conquer some 5,000 Jews and transform their lives. Christ's triumph would be the victory of love over hatred, of truth over error, and of life over death. But there was something else of profound significance that happened on this journey into Jerusalem. Now, it's not recorded in Mark's gospel, but we find it in Luke, and it's worth us spending a moment or two thinking about. Uh, the heading I've just put is the king's tears, the king's tears. You see, that road to Jerusalem at one point kind of descends into a little hollow. And after a, a, a few minutes' walk, uh, or sitting on the donkey, the, the path rises up to the crest of a ridge. And when it rises to the crest of the ridge, there spread out in front of the crowd was the whole city of Jerusalem. And as Jesus looked at the city, he saw the temple. Almost certainly he would have seen uh, evidence that there were great crowds of people in the city. And it says in verse 41, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. With a panorama of Jerusalem before his eyes, the Savior began to weep. Not with quiet tears, the quiet tears that he shed at the graveside of Lazarus just before he called Lazarus back to life. The, the word here is, is very specific, and it just means that Jesus howled. His body was wrecked as, as he just, he wept with all of his being. Now, the crowd looked on, and they would have been stunned. And surely they ceased shouting out their hosannas as they just watched Jesus weeping. Now, look what Luke says in verses 42 to 44. Jesus said through those sobs, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in from every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. You see, Jesus looked forward in time, and he saw the proud, unrepentant city of Jerusalem reduced to a pile of blood-soaked rubble. And 40 years later, the Roman legions would besiege the city 
and destroy it. I don't know if you've come across Josephus, that ancient historian, but he writes of that uh, sacking of Jerusalem, and, and I'm quoting to you, he said, Caesar ordered the whole city and the temple to be razed to the ground. The wall encompassing the city was so completely leveled to the ground as to leave future visitors to spot no ground for believing that it had ever been inhabited. Such was the end to which... Jerusalem came, a city of worldwide renown. And Jesus saw the city, and He wailed. And in those moments, I want to suggest to you that we get a glimpse of the heart of God. Because this is how God sorrows over hearts that miss their day. Look at verse 42. Even if you, even you, had only known on this day, what would bring you peace? But now it's hidden from you. If you had known on this day, but now it's hidden from you. Well, we ask the question, what would bring this peace of which Jesus speaks? Well, there are two things that we often talk about because they're really so fundamental and important. The first thing is, is repentance. Uh, the, the word is metanoia, and it just means an about turn. Instead of walking away from God or living our lives without reference to God, it means turning around and going towards God. It means changing our mind about how we think about sin. Sin is something that's offensive to God, and repentance is us lining up with God. And, and because we recognize that, it involves us taking a step towards Jesus and saying, Jesus, I am sorry that sin has touched my life. Please forgive me. That's what brings peace. The poet said it rather beautifully. The Son of God in tears, the wandering angels see. Be thou astonished, O my soul. He shed those tears for thee. The tears of Christ reveal the infinite value of your soul to God. And as Jesus went into Jerusalem all those years ago and wept, because Jerusalem largely, by and large, didn't recognize what would bring them peace, and they missed their opportunity. I just wonder, is Jesus weeping? over some of our souls today. And my prayer is that as we have walked this road just for a few moments alongside Jesus this morning, that we might be really concerned about finding the peace that the King of Peace offers us today. That's why He went to Jerusalem to die on a cross so that you and I might never face a judgment of condemnation, but rather a judgment of commendation, where he tells us we shall receive a reward for everything that we have done, even if we've given somebody a cup of cold water in Jesus' name. What an extraordinary passage of Scripture this is. The Son of God in tears, the wandering angels see. Be thou astonished, O my soul, he shed those tears for thee. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so very much that we catch a glimpse here of your heart and of the value that you place on our souls. We often don't place much value on them, Lord, but you do. It is extraordinary in our eyes the thought that you would weep because of us. And, oh God, our, our desire is not to make you weep, O oh Lord, but to bring a smile of pleasure to your face as we worship you as Savior and Lord and King. And so we pray that you'd lock your truths in our heart, rob us of peace until we make our peace with you. 
pour out a blessing upon the Sandyford Church family. Really encourage them at this time. We ask these things, saying thank you, in the beautiful name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless you.